Good morning. This is Jim Colburn of Commodity Research Group. I'm with Andy LeBeau, also of Commodity Research Group, and we're here to talk about energy markets. To learn more about us, you can check out our website at commodityresearchgroup.com, where we post our podcasts and blog. We'd like to thank our friends from EKT Interactive Oil and Gas Training for hosting this podcast. Check out their newsletters, podcasts, and learning modules at ektinteractive.com. This podcast should be construed as market commentary, merely observing economic, political, and market conditions, and is not intended to refer to or endorse any specific trading system, strategy, or recommendation. We are not responsible for trading decisions taken by anyone. Information is not guaranteed to be accurate. This is not an offer to buy or sell any derivative. It's the morning of June 20th, and uh, there's a lot going on, as usual, in the oil markets, Andy. But uh, first of all, why don't you talk about what's going on with the oil curve? Good morning, Jim, and good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, whenever you're listening to this, or maybe even good evening. We are seeing a, it's June 20th, the last trading day for July. And uh, July, August WTI has uh, rallied very sharply from like 30 cents over to uh, a dollar over. And Augie Sepp is, uh, has also rallied very sharply from the same thing from like 20 or 30 cents over to 80 or 90 cents over. They, it, it did actually July, Augie or June, July actually dipped into uh, Contango, I think recently i know the brent market did dip into uh contango but i i think there are a number of things going on in the in the front end of the curve and it's not it's not only wti uh we are seeing uh the front end get a little bit stronger globally but i think wti has its own uh internals going for it one uh, of course is the new pipeline that's opened in uh in canada became operational on may 1st that is uh taking oil from uh alberta to the west coast of canada which should allow which will allow exports for the canadian producers and that and that may remove some of the uh marginal barrel from uh coming into cushing uh cushing incidentally we've seen some decent draws in cushing over the last uh few weeks and the other thing uh, from a fundamental standpoint, is runs. Uh, runs have stayed really strong. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about that when we, when we talk about the, uh, the product markets. So there has been uh, s- some fundamental justification. And, and also, of course, we're, we're seeing um, position, you know, what, whatever is going on on the, on the position churn. And uh, in terms of positioning, the market went from liquidation to um to liquidation to short covering uh and outright buying over the last couple of weeks and, and i think that's been more concentrated in the front than in the uh in the back of the curve finally uh there is some uncertainty about whether or not whether or not bp is is uh moving their big maintenance up from september to july at their uh, mid-continent fact at their mid-continent refinery you know, some people might have sold the front bait thinking that they were moving it up and then had to cover. That's still a, a little bit unclear, but it, it's a big volume. So uh, I think that's also added to the uh, to the front end, strength in the front end. And then, Jim, the, there's the big macro. The big uh, the, and the big macro is the front looks OK. You know, if you look at the balances. And the back looks bad. Next year looks bad, which we will uh, which we will talk about. And I think that's probably uh, also leading to the um, you know lead, lead, leading to the spreads tightening up all, all across the you know all across the way. Like Dees Red Dees uh, has uh, has rallied, and um, so it, it, it's not only the front. And I think there's uh, a real lack of conviction. In, in buying the backs so uh you know it's it, it, as usual it's a very interesting market it is and i and i have to say that you know last month um even up 
uh, we, we're seeing more activity in the spread options. So there's there's a uh, you know like I, I want to say twenty five thousand lots a day trading last month. That's a big number. But the 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 number one in spread options. So the number one open into interest spread option right now is the Augie SEP uh, plus two dollar call. Uh, there's a there's about fourteen thousand or so open interest on that, and um, it just tells you I, I I do like looking at uh, extremes and in uh, in in options. It just gives you a sense of you know sometimes it's it's crazy people at work. Sometimes it's people with an idea, and um, so these like I said last month there these things were very active and into this month as well. So some there's somebody out there or many people or few people. Uh, I think that that spread could go even higher. It's interesting. You would think the runs could continue stronger, longer this year because wasn't didn't we do a heavy maintenance period in the springtime this year? Yeah, we did. The runs number, and I think in talking to uh, colleagues and and to the market. You know, runs went over 17 million, crude runs went over 17 million barrels a day. And, you know, I, I don't think anybody had 17 million barrels a day of uh, crude runs in their forecasts. I mean, that number, I was thinking, uh, well, I think this year we'll be lucky to get up to like 16.7 million barrels a day or 16.8 at the very top. And it, it's over 17 million barrels a day now. Um, so refiners came back with, with guns blazing out of, um, you know, out, out of maintenances. So, uh, let's, let's, uh, continue with the big fundamental. You're, you're not talking about Tim Duncan, but you're talking about the IEA's, uh, report. Uh, they, they come out with a monthly report and then they, which is a short-term, uh, look, and then they have a medium-term report that came out as well. And you want to you discuss what got the market interested in those i think the uh well at the market's always interested in the iea monthly report uh, right. no matter what it it tends to it tends to make headlines um as does the opec report and and uh unfortunately the eia uh which i think has been pretty close lately they've done a great job you know they they never get headlines yeah, we uh, we we've been talking about that for a couple of years now. How underrated the 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 uh, DOE's uh, EIA uh, monthly supply demand report. It's very good. Yeah, they made some changes over the last few years, and it's it, it's pretty good. I mean, they they they've been close. I mean, mm -hmm. like everybody else, the price projection may not be perfect, but their numbers have been pretty good. But anyway, getting back to the uh, IEA report, and actually. The OPEC report and and the EIA report, you know, both both OPEC, uh, I'm sorry, both the EIA, the IEA, and us CRG are not looking for much on the demand side this year. I think we we've been saying this year is going to be hard pressed to get much over a million barrels a day. Um, you know, maybe 1.2, and the, the IEA, which somehow ramped up their demand at the beginning of the year to 1.3 1.4 you know they recently cut it and said yeah you're right or they didn't say to me you're right but they said demand was going to be around a million barrels a day up and that's sort of where the eia is they're they're up uh a million barrels a day but opec still is sticking to their 2.2 million barrel a day increase uh for 2020 over 2023 which is just you know fantastic uh, fantasy really uh particularly since we we already have half the year in uh you know demand the demand the data isn't good you know the data is uh you know we're showing at best a million barrels a day growth and probably less than that um so you're gonna have to have a rock and roll second half to get uh anywhere near 2.2 million barrels a day and, and things just aren't setting up that way jim it's just not you know it doesn't look like you're going to get you know to get 2.2 million a barrel a day growth you know they're going to need something like 
you know, what, three and a half to four million barrel a day growth in the second half. That's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, do, do you get the sense these two groups are politicizing their numbers? I mean, that's. Yeah, I, I think more and more and more we're definitely seeing politic politicization yes. of uh, OPEC and, uh, and the IEA. And they seem to be, go you know, they, they seem to be going at each other. You know, the IEA famously said a couple of years ago, we shouldn't be investing anymore in fossil fuels, which is, you know, which was ridiculous. And uh, OPEC called them on it. And now the IEA is saying that demand is going to peak in 2029. And OPEC's calling them on that, too. Right. They, they, they're, uh, I have to say, what came out of the IEA over the last uh, was a week or so has been bearish, especially, like you said, for the like their their midterm report or rather rather their their monthly report is looking for more of a surplus in the sec second uh year out uh 2025 and and the market rallied off of that so right you know they i remember 2016 came out with a very bearish report and uh you know i think it, i'm not sure if they were the ones that said they were swimming in oil but it was something like that and and the mark and that, that was like the bottom so uh, it, it either means you know they they have this bias or possibly that the market ha puts so much uh weight on what they say that you know opec sees that and, and changes the supply situation so and also they we're, we're all wrong at times but they, <laughs> they they can be wrong big time so the OPEC actions, though, Andy, seem to be contrary to their OPEC report. So if you're if you're looking at, you know, this two million barrel plus demand for this year, um, you're you're considering letting out more barrels. You know, it, it, put it this way, OPEC, OPEC was like cut, started cutting production before anybody had a really softening uh demand picture i think people are still plugging in china as a big right uh, increase in demand so so the opec actions seem to be more uh market realistic than say uh the opec uh a analyst report would you say that's true oh yeah i think the as you pointed out when we were discussing this you know the, the saudis see what see demand because they see what their customers are doing Right. And, uh, you know, I, I think they tend to rely on both their internal forecasts as well as forecasts of others, not necessarily, certainly not the IEA. And, uh, it looks certainly not like their own OPEC, you know, their, their own group, you know. And um, I, I think you're right. And the Saudis were quick to come out after the OPEC meeting on in early June when the market pretty much collapsed, not collapsed, but really sold off, you know, down the $72 basis, um, the nearby WTI, you know, the Saudis had to do some serious damage control. And why did they have to do serious damage control? Because they printed, they, they put out a roadmap for the unwind and for net you know for fourth quarter and into 2025 and if you if you read the roadmap carefully enough it was a roadmap to take you right off the cliff because <laughs> production was gonna you know they've, they've got to unwind 2.2 million barrels a day uh over the next from the fourth quarter into the into the fourth quarter of next year and looking at where demand is going to be next year it would mean a surplus of easily easily a million barrels a day average for uh 2025. so in other words there's no room for an unwind and um you know unless demand is is surging next year which again doesn't look likely you know demand would really have to surge so the saudis had to come out and say you know we're, we're gonna we're gonna check the market we may not necessarily do what we're printing here what we, we've released uh depending on the market but nevertheless 
you know, there's that fear that, okay, you know, next year's balances don't look good even without the big increases. You know, if we do see big increases next year, it's going to be really, really challenging. And there are, uh, you know, you're going to get an increase from non-OPEC producers then an increase from non-OPEC that that's going to happen no matter what, you know, and that's going to be about a million and a half. I have a million six. I think the other guys have like one five to one seven, but you know, everybody's around, around the same numbers for, you know, with increases from the um, U S Canada, for sure. Uh, Brazil and Guyana and others. So, you know, how do you, how do you fit into that? Yeah, it's it's interesting to me that the OPEC looks more and more like the Fed now. They have a dot plot, you know. You 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 call it, or, <laughs> right. they have a roadmap, and they're giving guidance. You know, it's they're like giving, they're giving forward guidance. guidance. And and um, I remember like when we when we you got into this analyzing oil way before I did, but OPEC used to be kind of the 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 price. Uh, what do you call it? The dove. You know they had they had the most oil reserves, and they wanted to make sure they maintained uh, market share amongst you know OPEC and non OPEC, but also maybe alternative that they were looking at maybe uh, co conservation at the time, not not so much alternative energies, but they wanted to make sure that their you know their their oil reserves had value. And, oh, and they and they didn't want to kill the economies either. They wanted to keep the economies growing because they felt like uh, that would increase oil demand which it did and now they seem to be more like interested in uh they're more price hawks not maybe the hawkish hawkish of the hawks but they definitely are trying to keep prices above a certain level and and then in the meantime they're watching you know their market share erode and so right. any anything you want to say about that agree disagree well, yeah i I think I agree with you, Jim. They're, they're, you know, they're they're in a different uh, regime now, and the, and the regime, of course, is MBS's regime, because the Saudis have, uh, uh, at least according to the IMF, that they said they, the IMF said they needed ninety seven dollars to break even on their, um, you know, for for their budget ninety seven dollar crude, um, and they they've got a big you know they're spending money on the that neom city uh they're spending right. money on professional golfers and <laughs> now they want to get into boxing and wrestling and you know tennis and who and who knows what else but they're they're certainly spending on you know there's big and the social uh, you know realistic things this you know social expenditures and defend and now defense expenditures so you know they they need a high price now and, right uh you know that's the uh, i think you're right that's what they're per, that's what they're pursuing their other option which they which you and i have lived through uh a number of times yes. in our careers right is the good sweating right where they just say you know what let's just open it up right and uh you know take some take our medicine you know next year and try to remove some marginal to remove some competition and um you know we've seen that one right as early as recently as 2020 right as recently as, tw as yeah. 2020 yeah. exactly, exactly. Exac exacerbated the uh lower prices so uh crude oil i i was mentioning uh like outlandish option trades that kind of raise an eyebrow but um this this one that happened uh, within the last week didn't you know I don't I'm not going to put a lot of weight into it but um, looks like uh, over four thousand um, I don't know if it was done as a stra strangle but August twenty dollar puts four thousand August twenty dollar puts four thousand August two hundred dollar calls traded at a at a penny each and so I was mentioning before that spread options. Uh, there was a, there were some outlier trades uh, when when um, before the prices went negative way before the prices went negative, and um, I'm thinking, you know, <laughs> this is kooky to me. I don't know what this is about, but um, I, I really I I agree with the market. There's a very very low 
extremely, extremely low prob probability that one of these options expires in the market. But, you know, when you have that thought experiment, what, you know, is gold bullish or bearish when, when the world's about to end, you know, maybe, maybe they're playing something like, like that. I, I don't know. I, don't, I have no idea what that's about, but I just want to point out that there's crazy stuff happening. Uh, but we'll, we'll leave that. But in, in crude oil options, I think the kind of news, if there's any news, is is that the volatility is is bouncing around 22, 23 percent. So that's that's a really low number. Usually, the, the all-time low was was set as as long, was around 12 something, 12 point something during the the uh, April. I think it was April, May, June time period. So it's a springtime. It tends to be a low number in in vol. But, um, you know, it, it just seems like there's a lot more going on. But then when you look at the price action, you know, we've been between 70 and 90 since uh, since like 2022, um, you know, maybe even closer to 75, 90 ish, you know. And, and so there hasn't been a, a lot going on. And I and I think the IEA said this is it late last year. And I and I chuckled at them that, you know, they see a, a market balance going into the, you know, into 2024 so they they were right on about that but i just uh i guess being being a commodity guy i'm always looking for the next uh blast in prices one way or the other um so kudos to to them and um yeah i was wrong so that that's the news that you know volumes have picked up a little bit the only it's hard to you know not being on a desk and seeing what why and what people are doing exactly the only thing i'll pull out from this is that it seems a little bit like a ra the option guys are trading ranges as well. So you see the market go up and more open interest is being put on the put side than the call side. And then when the price goes to the bottom end of the range, more emphasis is put on or more open interest is in the call side than the put side. So it's kind of counter to what you might uh, expect in a trending market or a market that's about to blast one direction or the other. Yeah, I guess the, the surprise to me was the price movement up. But so let's let's talk about products for a second. Gasoline, the gasoline season is a little bit underwhelming, to say the least. To say the, the least. Gasoline, to say the least. The you know there was a there was a big hype on Memorial Day. You know it was going to be a record number of drivers, and maybe it was, but. The, the the numbers the first of all there was the anecdotal stuff coming from the retailers and the wholesalers saying they weren't really seeing uh, as big a pulls that as they would expect and then came the numbers from the um, EIA and they were they were they were mediocre it didn't show it we were actually behind last year mm. and uh, you know you would have I would have expected and did expect that we'd see at least a little growth. And this is the, you know, this is the big problem for gasoline. It's in a, it's in a no growth environment. And um, the getting back to the IEA, the, um, you know, they're looking for gasoline demand to decline, every, not every year, but we're, we're going to peak like this year or next, and then, then start declining because of the uh, fleet efficiency. And of course, the uh ev competition and um you know we're, we're seeing it in the in the demand numbers now again july 4th is supposed to be a record this year uh so we'll we'll see what uh we'll, we'll see what we get but i think that the the other thing that's happened to gasoline is refiners you know they were expecting a big they were expecting a, a good gasoline drive this season uh, it's certainly not over yet because we still have july and august ahead of us but they really as we said before they cranked it out and gasoline inventories are have been have been building and now they're in surplus the the cracks really came off hard they, they've rallied back a little bit but you know it, it's really not a great it, it, it it's not a great environment right now certainly for for refiners their the margins are better than they are historically but you know again it, it's hard to trace where you're going to see some serious growth on the on 
gasoline demand. You know, maybe it'll be on export demand, but that's probably not going to happen either because there's a big new refinery opening up in South America, uh, in Mexico. And there's a monster refinery that, that is underway in, in Nigeria. So, you know, the, the Atlantic Basin is going to get very long gasoline. And uh, it's going to mean that uh, Asia is really going to have to crank it up. And Asia hasn't been. So the margins in, in Asia are, are also, you know, are, are, are you know, they're, they're not at run cut levels yet, but they're getting there. U.S. not at run cut levels, but it's getting there. It's getting there too. So um, yeah, gasoline is is uh, just not performing as well as what uh, had been had been expected. Yeah, uh, just a couple of things, Andy, and what you're saying. The um, anecdotally as well that people I know that, have, including myself, that have bought hybrids are thrilled with them that. They get better mileage. You can go all electric if you want to for a little while, and then you go back to the gasoline to charge it up. Or you know, I I, I think that's what the e, the the EV sales have kind of you know short. Just it's, I think it's just one year where they flattened a little bit, maybe even yeah, down. Yeah, definitely. But the but the hybrids I think are really uh, soaring still because you you know you don't have to you you can, you can still fill up fill up your car with gas. You don't have to wait for the for the charging and. Um, there's still not all, you know, they're, they're highlighted, but there's still not a lot of charging stations around. People with EVs are happy as well. I shouldn't, you know, put that down too much. But I think I think the growth, potential growth or, or fast growth is you, you can feel comfortable buying a, uh, a hybrid car because you're still kind of doing the same thing you always did. You go to the gas station, fill it up, not, not as many times. So I, I think that's probably going to, uh, continue the the uh, part about new refineries in Mexico and Nigeria. I you know living in New York, I have this thing that maintenance is is underrated. Our our roads are a shambles. We we pay high taxes and and our governments can't pave the roads for some reason. And I I think that's kind of everywhere where the the big news is the the new thing that's come out and people forget. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta take care of it, and 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 so, um, I hear you about new refining capacity. Um, I I'm guessing the the real important number down the road is going to be effective, or or what's what can be what's online. We'll we'll see. Totally. Maybe. I mean, yeah, uh, we're we're not. Mexico's had Mexico's running at only sixty percent total refinery capacity, and that that's up. So they right. they they're not well known for uh, running a, a good show on their uh, on their refineries in Nigeria. It is privately owned that that six hundred thousand barrel a day refinery, but um, you know they they've certainly had all kinds of problems in their um, in their petroleum industry to say to say the least. So I, I think you're right. And 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 talking about uh, maintenance, you know we 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 are expected to have a big hurricane season and that that may you know if that takes out some refinery capacity that may help that may help margins may not do well do much for demand but you know could that could that could help margins in the in the short term and then there's diesel then there's diesel well that was uh, you, you that's i was going to say what about diesel that was my yeah what question. about diesel well, let's talk about well, diesel the diesel gasoline's had a rough start to the first half of the year uh diesel's really had a rough start diesel demand in the u.s is down five percent from uh from last year which is um you know that obviously is a, is a big number you know i, th I think it's like two hundred thousand a day 150 to 200 a day and uh we we certainly had a warm winter which took out some demand and uh manufacturing has been uh, a real a real problem for you know for years now and uh the, there are some green shoots on the on the manufacturing side so you know maybe diesel will maybe demand will pick up some uh in in the second half but it, it's really been uh you know it's been a dr big drag and cracks have gotten hammered all over the world uh on uh on diesel 
And um, the other thing that is that's hurting U.S. refiners, petroleum refiners, is the the big boom in renewable diesel demand. Renewable diesel is is not petroleum based and um, can be used as a substitute for uh, for diesel. On the, at least the, you know it's basically manufactured and used on the West Coast. So what's happening is um, refiners are, are cranking it out on, not refiners, but I should say, man, a lot of them are refiners that are making the renewable diesel. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, what, what they're doing is, is manufacturing the renewable diesel, banking the credits that they're getting for manufacturing it, and then exporting the petroleum diesel. So you know, as long as there's demand for uh, petroleum di diesel, but that's got to be, you know, there's competition for that because it's exported to the to Asia. Right. So, um, you know, another government program that looks like it's going awry. Maybe. Yeah. But the, the bottom line is, is demand and, and, you know, production and demand for uh, renewable diesel and biodiesel, you know, continues to continues to grow. And uh, that that also is uh, hurting diesel demand. I haven't so I haven't heard you talk about the possibility of run cuts. Is it way too early for this? Yeah, way too early. It's way too early. I, I think the um, you know again we'll see what's going on with the, that big uh, Indiana plant whether the, whether there's maintenance there or, or not. But the margins are still good enough that you're going to run. So, and there's still enough export demand and, you know, I, I don't think, I think it's too early here to talk about run cuts, you know, again, maybe, maybe, maybe in Asia, Europe, their, their margins have also improved a little bit. So I, I think it's a little, you know, it's, a, it's a little too early. Yeah. It's, I wonder uh, if it would be a, a play to you know, do your maintenance early and be prepared for the uh, hurricane season. You know, in, in it would be it would be if you could, you know, again, not again, but to schedule a maintenance is not that easy. You right. know, to move your maintenance around, you got to right. get everything. You know, People to involved. say nothing of the labor. Right, I was going to say, yeah, you know, that's the hard. That's really the hard part. Yeah. So you know, diesel, I guess. If you're bullish on the global economy and you think that manufacturing is is gonna pick up, you know, there there may be there may be room for diesel cracks to increase some. So um the, the little bit of anecdotal evidence of the people I talk to, they seem to the Memorial Day seem to be a uh more of a flying holiday this year than a driving holiday and and um that one one uh bright spot in demand is uh is jet fuel right yeah jet fuel demand is up uh like fifty thousand barrels a day so far this year over last year but remember jet fuel demand is only like seven or eight percent of the barrel right of um total uh, of total demand not of the barrel of of uh of total demand so it's great that it's up and the other big winners have been the uh, NGLs and HGLs. You know, they're they're up. Their demand is is up as well. But really, for demand surge, you need you need um, gasoline and diesel. You know, to show some signs of life, particularly right. U.S. gasoline. It's so important. You know, U.S. gasoline demand is so important. It's ten percent. You know, it's it's like ten percent of of total demand, the right. global demand. is our is our gasoline demand. Yeah. So a crummy gasoline season is not the, is certainly you know doesn't fit into the OPEC the whole OPEC demand boom. So um, before I ask you about your price forecast, cause you just want to talk about this uh, the stock levels uh, again. You we you have it tightening. Staying I do, yeah, yeah. I have it tightening a little. I, although I now, you know, we had a slight. We thought May, we, the second quarter was going to draw, 
And now I, it looks like second quarter globally stocks are going to build because U.S. stocks, U.S. stocks, Jim, are up. Let me think. It's up like 50 million barrels since the first quarter. A lot, a lot of that is, you know, refined products because the crude is flat. Refined products, the uh, propane, um, you know, the, the NGLs are up a lot. The gasoline and, and diesel are, are up as well because demand wasn't wasn't quite as strong. But globally, it does look like, and the IEA mentioned this, that uh, there, there were big big stock builds in uh, April and, and uh, into May. It looks like China built some stocks. So I, I think second quarter, we, we probably, you know, we were unchanged to build. And in third quarter, I think we're going to see a little, you know, a bit of a, a draw, uh, particularly since OPEC did not increase as they as was you know they had said so they're going to keep production steady and then in fourth quarter they're going to increase and I think that we're still going to see a slight draw and then we'll see what you know we'll see what next year you know what's going to happen with next year and uh, one thing we haven't talked about in this podcast is uh, geopolitics which. You know the market has, uh, as it does. You know when things are when things are calm, or yeah. it looks like they're calm, even though they may be bubbling like crazy under the surface. You know, like in Lebanon, right? You know, the market's like, oh, there's no, you know, there's no risk. But right, right. That's naturally, yeah. yeah. You know, That's you cool. mentioned the you mentioned the vols. Yeah, twenty two percent. It's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Right, we have we have a potential war breaking out. Yep, and and, uh, and, and one being fought still. And and the, and the more you look at the charts, the more you see you you get this long, longer and longer term uh, trading range market. You feel comfortable with that trading range market, and that's how a lot of people. Oh, I can see where it breaks out, so I'm going to sell that call and that put, and right, and and that brings it down even more. So it's interesting. Well, let's let's talk about uh, price levels. What do you, well, what do you let's talk about? Uh, I'm, I'm, it's hard to get. You know, I just talked about. I think we're going to see some modest stock draws in the second half, which will be, you know, that'll be bullish. It's it's hard to say what's been priced in already. You know, I, I was thinking after the OPEC meeting that seventy to eighty would be the range, and then you know the market came back some. Uh, and I you took you call it that, the WTI, yeah, WTI, yeah. And then the market came back some, and you know, I'm thinking, all right, 72, 82. Now, you know, maybe maybe we have a shot at 85, you know, may, maybe if, if demand can pick up in the second half. And you know, I guess in terms of the flow, you know, the, that's all what's what's you know, what's the Fed gonna do, and you know, risk assets and that. And, you know that that's that's flow, but I think from fundamentals, you know, may maybe an outside shot at, at eighty five. As I said, the big problem is what well, is looking ahead at next year. You know, the big fundamental it looks it looks gruesome right now. Just using that roadmap, and you know, they're they're not going to be able to increase. But nevertheless, you know, is the market going to roll up to where we are now, or is it going to roll down to where we are in the backs? Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's, that's the big question because mm -hmm. things could really, things could really unravel badly if, um, you know, if they pursue the, the unwind. I think the, uh, the IMF is looking at like over 3% growth for 2024 and 2025. You know, you would expect that to be positive for, oil demand overall uh, but we do have these you know these these you know clean tech things coming in well i should say evs hybrid stuff we talked about biofuels things like that so it's kind of a be an interesting uh you know kind of tracking this peak demand and then in the background you also have increasing 
demand for um, that the plastics, uh, uh, petro uh, petrochemicals, and things like that. So, um, what's what do you think if if we're going to break out? So you, you look kind of looking at a little a, a grind, grinding range when and you've been right. Yeah, for, grinding range. Like, yeah. yeah. You, you maybe maybe it, it, it tipped out of a little bit for a little while on on the bottom side this time, but if if there was a breakout one way or the other well which way would you say it would go like, would you be uh, would, you, would you be worried more about the bottom side of your range uh not holding or the top side of your range i guess because there's a because there's a you know geopolitical brush fire still going on yeah uh, i guess it would be the the top end but you know, depending on where, you know, where the Saudis want to go next year, you know, as I said, it could easily, it could easily be the bottom end if they, if they decide to pursue the, um, you know, the scorched earth strategy, which it, again, it doesn't look like they're, they want to do that given what their needs are, but, you know, given what their fiscal needs are, but, you know, again, we, you and I have seen them you know, change, change course. Yeah. I, I, I was always thinking like a few years ago when I'm trying to figure out the adoption of uh, electric vehicles, I, I felt like it was going to be a, a zigzag where, you know, you, you start getting uh critical mass in electric vehicles and that reduces the demand for gasoline prices come down and then prices are cheap. So people are fine buying, gasoline you know just like they've always done by gasoline cars and and then um demand goes up again you know there's this ratchet but there's also there's also this issue of a you know kind of a mandate where you know the, the, since it's hard to raise taxes uh our governments are you know passing these uh you know laws like like in california i think they don't they, they're trying to get rid of internal combustion engines and um so it's, it's it, my point is that a lot of a lot of the um adoption of these non fossil fuel uses is is a mandate it's not even a market a price a, a, a price generated movement so it's it's like the Saudis are probably saying this is inevitable like we're gonna, you look around the world it's inevitable that uh we reach a peak demand i'm not saying that obviously but right um, and, and then now what do we do and and right. you know, you, yeah they're investing and in, they got they got the sovereign wealth fund going on high that you know issuing stock for aramco doing all kinds of sort of risk mitigating uh type things i guess trying to build a city with to draw like a, like a high tech high high tech uh city maybe to draw you know more people over there more investment that kind of thing but clearly have changed the way and I, I but OPEC policy you know when you go back it's only successful in in demand increasing periods when when we see demand contracting they have a hard time yeah that's a great point so, they really have, that's a great point they really have a hard time there's one one thing I do that I want to add before we end this let's also not forget there's a war in Europe going on and of course. Uh, you know that the, we we still have no you know trying to get a handle on on some of the russian numbers uh continues to be pretty difficult but we'll see you know where where you know that they promised to cut back they they said they were going to get down to 9 million barrels a day of um crude production i think they got down to like 915 uh but we'll see where they you know where they want to go in, in terms of their exports and their policy and how tight, you know, the, um, the West wants to get on, uh, on their exports, uh, you know, on the sanctions, but uh, yeah. whether or not, or whether or not they're going to enforce them. Right. And, and, um, same thing for Iran. I mean, there's right. Same for Iran. But in, in, um, Ukraine is getting more, uh, capabilities to strike within Russia and, you know, Biden has, kind of ask them not to not to bomb refineries i want i wonder how much refinery capacity will be bombed after the election if depending that's on a, who, that's another good point because you know, 
Yeah, they all spring. They they were all over those refineries, and they just took out a um, storage facility. So, um, so let, let's yeah. not forget that that is no, still we... going on. And and as we always say, where the disruption is is not where you think it. It's not what you had planned, right. right? There's always something happens that you had you know were not thinking about. I, are you trying to say unknown unknowns? I am trying to say there are a lot of unknown. We still have a lot of unknown. There are yeah. known unknowns. Yeah. Right? What was that quote? The known unknowns and the yeah. unknown unknowns. Donald Rumsfeld. I, yeah. I, I thought I said you know I thought that was brilliant when he said that. I mean I you know uh, anyway uh, it's a good good way to manage risk. Um, I mean getting into this market just a quick you know history andy when we we came in for this market through commodities i mean you were looking at cocoa i was looking at grains and we kind of had a different sort of take on on what prices could do than say uh when we started getting in you know brushing or, or, or talking with people who are all came in from the equity markets i mean it they, they kind of had a different you know sense of or, or I, I should say lack of sense. I, I just thought that the commodity coming in from the commodity markets gave you a much more healthy respect for risk than um, than from the equity markets. But uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, we're all uh, we all have these twitches, you know. We have these nervous ticks that <laughs> doesn't can, go away. Can slapped <laughs> around. <laughs> right. Even many decades later, it still doesn't go away. It doesn't. And as much as I tease you know, other organizations about their, uh, their price, their bad price calls. It's, it's what I'm really poking at is, is the arrogance that they come out with and say with confidence. And we know it's, it's, it's a hard thing to do. Right. Yeah. Tell, tell us about it. Tell us about it. Uh, yeah, anything else? Uh, we no, I think that's it. Okay. Uh, if you want to reach me, it's a Lebo at commodity research group.com. And, uh, thank you, Jim. You're welcome, Andy. I'll catch you next month. And I'm I'm on LinkedIn. I post. I'll, I'm about to post this podcast, but then I'm, I'll post. Uh, I want to do the updated chart of uh, implied vol just to show how where we are and uh, like the 22 percent is is a is a quite a low number. One of, one of the best charts of all times and is your implied vol chart going back I to the beginning. time immemorial. I, I should I should be in the uh, uh, what is it the, the world world record book. Um, I think I'm the only person who has the implied volatility going back to November fourteenth, nineteen eighty six. No question. And that's you know I'm not treat, being treated for OCD either. <laughs> but, but but I should be. <laughs> Okay, next next All month. right, on that next note. Time. All right.